to Chicago Theater Review. I'm Frank and we are at the Auditorium Theater. So what we're doing with this show today is because of the holidays, we had to get our two holiday shows in. We actually filmed this during the holidays and the Auditorium Theater just celebrated its 125th anniversary. And we had Michael Roberts with us and one of our interviews was with that famous actor who's from Chicago who's been on television and has done numerous stage work here in Chicago and New York, John Mahoney. So let's now go to that interview. Welcome to Chicago <laughs> Theatre Review and I'm Frank and next to me is Michael Roberts who you've seen on the show co-hosting many of times last year, I the am. last two years. Yes, you can't afford me anymore though. But Michael <laughs> hates Chicago so much that he moved away <laughs> and now he's a big shot in LA. <laughs> but I still love you. Now, you have a show out in LA called? Showbiz Nation Live. And it's a podcast? No, no, no it is a, a national radio show, dear. See, it's a national radio yeah. show. That's how I told you how much I know, but that's LA. This is Chicago. But luckily he came into Chicago because we're celebrating the 125th anniversary of the Auditorium Theater. Yeah, I got you invited. And, yeah, and he wanted me to come <laughs> along and trash, trash him and see if I could trash <laughs> right. him Right. But he, he'll always get the, the run up on me. So, and Patty Lapone still has that restraining order against me, so we gotta be careful. I am dying to meet the idol that I would, the woman that I would go to bed with right now, but. <laughs> oh, wow, ew. Her and Betty Buckley and Linda Carter have been the three women on my to-do list that would be the ones that I would. I, I, I'm just, my mind is just going places right now, Frank, that it should not be going, <laughs> really. Not, no porn company would ever take that. <laughs> it could be a musical though. It could be, a man's desire. But he's in town and he's doing some interviews. And you saw the one show that we did with the auditorium. Now we're doing a, a second show and that's with, uh, you just did a show with um, Mahoney from Chicago. Mahoney, Mah is that what you call him? <laughs> <laughs> is that, well, call him Clyde, why don't you? You know, Frazier's father. No, I'm not ignoring you, but I am actually talking to my, my producer on my side because he's <laughs> like, um, you know, we're not on right now. I know. <laughs> well, it, it's on my show, on oh. my show, Frank. Oh. Yeah. So keep hey, talking. I can multitask. <laughs> my friend Gail Short taught me how to multitask. So. And we can talk about right way. Well, what's, what's right. right so right way is this phenomenal animal shelter. Is that this you, the one that, that you yes that we the PSA, last year. and they made a lot of money, and uh, and they yeah adopted a lot of doggies. Did you get one? No. Okay, no. I got two rescue cats and you couldn't even get a parakeet? Well, I'm Okay, <laughs> remember, this we're gonna have to cut out considering mine is a G-rated Oh, that's show. right, that's right. <laughs> I, I forgot, that's Comcast. <laughs> I'm so sorry. We're gonna cut this all sorry. Off. Okay. okay, let's go back to right... <laughs> okay, we have Right Way Animal Shelter that you've been a big fan of for the last two years that I know of. Yes, yes, because of my friend Gail Shore and David Friend. And that's where they adopted um, their dog, Cooper, who's the cutest little thing. And where is Right Way located? Well, that's the whole issue. Um, the original, a bus ran into it. Right. Now, wait, but then they just, they reopened. They reopened. A brand new building and, uh, in Morton Grove. Uh, in Morton Grove, yes. And I was going to ask my phenomenal assistant over there where it was. And it's only three blocks from my producer's house. What do you mean? I know. So, and he was there for their grand opening. So, Aww. see, see what you get for being in LA. <laughs> <laughs> There's dogs out there. Yeah. Usually they're pulled back like this. <laughs> but so what we're going to do is because this is a, simulta a simulcast type show, I'm basically going to be stepping out, and he's going to do all the interviewing. So this way you know what's going on and why it's being played on my show. So is there anything you uh, want? I, I, I somehow remember you were sitting there during that interview. But that was the first show. Remember, we're doing. Oh, that's right. We're I, doing I, I should be doing a costume change. That's OK. People won't remember. This you know all the clothes we took from the storage locker yesterday? Uh -huh. For this very purpose. Now people are going to see me in two different weeks in the same outfit. OK, this show might be played in April and look at I'm still in a, in a uh, Christmas Then I should outfit. have an Easter hat. <laughs> Honest to God. So let's get to the interview that um, Michael is going to do right now. 
and I will see you from Chicago Theater Review. See you at the theater. The cheap parking. <laughs> old theater. The world got to know him as Martin Crane in the hit series Frasier, for which he received an Emmy as Best Supporting Actor. Ladies and gentlemen, this man needs no introduction. Please welcome John Mahoney. How are you? Great oh to be God. here. Thank Great you to be so here. much, Mr. Mahoney. <laughs> I have seen you in almost everything you're ever in here. Well, thank From you. From New York Light to Steppenwolf. And yeah. boy, oh boy, you can act. I don't know if anybody's ever told you <laughs> thank that. You. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I keep trying. One of these days, it'll, it'll all fall into place. <laughs> <laughs> One day you'll do television. Right, yeah. yes, yeah. So what do they have you doing here? Right now, I'm hosting the evening. I'm going to be introducing all these wonderful people like Patti LuPone and Chicago Symphony and the Opera and, and uh, just really telling the history of the Auditorium Theater, which is a lot more interesting than it sounds. <laughs> right, but it is. And oh, it is. You're a Chicago boy. Yeah, it's, it's a real pleasure. It's an honor to be doing this. This is absolutely great for me that they offered, you know, they asked me to do it. I was very flattered. So. Let's go back. Let's okay. go back to when you were a little boy. Uh huh. And what made you want to go into theater? I just all it was one of the things I was always good at, and I was never. Uh, I just enjoyed doing it. I started when I was uh, really young. I was in an, a theater company in England called the Stratford Children's Theater, where I played like Polonius when I was twelve. <laughs> played all, always the character actor, never the star, but which is fine. But. I just, I've just done it all my life. I've done it since I was a little kid, and I always felt more at home on stage than off. But when did you know you were good? Oh, uh, probably, I thought I really belonged uh, probably when I, when I got the Tony. <laughs> you know, that, that'll, sort of, that'll do it for you, you know what I mean? All of a sudden I knew that I, I wasn't going on auditions anymore, <laughs> that I was being called in for meetings and to right. say hello and to discuss a script as opposed to sitting there and, and reading something cold. So that I figured, okay, well, I must, I must be doing something right. So how did Steppenwolf come to be? I did, a, I was taking acting classes at the St. Nicholas Theater with William H. Macy, you know, who's on Shameless mm -hmm. now, and Steve Schachter and uh, David Mamet had started it. Never heard of him. <laughs> <laughs> and I was cast out of the class that I was doing into a, a new David Mamet play at that time, which was called The Water Engine. And that was my debut, and I had, to, uh, I had to join Equity because I got promoted into a bigger part than the play extended. Then the next play I did was with John Malkovich. It was a play called uh, Ashes. And John and I just hit it off so well, and he asked me to join Steppenwolf when they expanded the company. And that was how I, you know, it was really how I got involved with all that. It was John. I, I owe an awful lot to John. And why does Steppenwolf succeed? Like, not just succeed, I mean, it is the benchmark yeah. of theater companies. How it's run, the shows they do, you know, the back yeah. and the front yeah. is just impeccable. It always has been. You know, I'm not sure how to answer that because obviously to be an actor, you've got to have an ego. You have to think that you can do things. Right. You have to, you know, you, and yet somehow the members of our company managed to suppress that. They managed to go strictly right for the best part of the play. That, you know, it, it's like when I was doing Frasier. It was the same way with Kelsey. He didn't care if he got great laughs. Uh, he, didn't, he loved it when David did or when I did. What he wanted was a great show. And I will honestly say that that's what happens at Steppenwolf. We want a great show. We don't care who the star is. We don't care how big your part is and how small somebody else. We want everybody to combine and put out a great show. That's, and that might be why. So it's how a, did you transition to television? It was, um, what happened was I had done, uh, well, I'd done a couple of series uh, after House of Blue Leaves on Broadway. But with Frasier, it was serendipity. Uh, some guy was doing a guest spot on Cheers, and he freaked out. And he walked out in the middle of the taping. I can't mention any names or anything. But anyway, so yes, they sir. didn't. <laughs> I'll tell you later. Uh, but so uh, they were missing an actor in this one particular thing. And somebody said, oh, you know, I saw this guy, John Mahoney, in Chicago. He was playing. He, he played piano on stage in New York. And I think it, so they said, will you come in and do it? And I said, yeah, I'd love to because I love Cheers. And it was that that's what really established me in television because 
the, the guys who had written that episode of Cheers were the guys who created the, uh, Frasier. And they said to me, would you be Frasier's dad? Would you be Kelsey's dad? And I said, well, I have to see a script first. And, you know, and so they said, okay. So about six months later, they came to Chicago with a script. And we went to the Shaw's Crab House. <laughs> and they sat at one end of the table eating crab. I sat at the other end of the table reading the script. And I said, absolutely. You know, you'd have to be out of your mind to turn this down. Yeah. Writing. So, yeah. So that's how I got involved with that. I had uh, Helen did on my show a couple weeks oh, ago. Oh, really? Yeah. And we were talking about um, just in the late 60s and 70s with sitcoms, uh -huh. they were all uh, led by theater actors. Yeah. You know, like Linda Lab. And, that's and, right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we, everybody on Frasier, they, we all came from the same background. Right. You know, Kelsey was doing Othello, I think it was, uh, for Joe Papp when he, when he went to do Cheers. David has been all over the world with, with Peter Brooks and everybody else performing Chekhov in Russia. Uh, Jane started in Cabaret on Broadway. Perry spent all her, all her free time at the uh, Williamstown Theater Festival. We're all from a theater background and that is all of, a, and we all seem to want the same thing, a, you know, a good show. And, uh, and I think the best shows are people like that. And plus, uh, our directors and our creators of our show sought out theater directors to direct all our episodes. So with the exception right. of Jim Burroughs, who, you know, is unparalleled, virtually all our other uh, uh, directors of our show were from the theater, were from Broadway or off-Broadway. And, uh, you know, it just, it, they kept us honest. So <laughs> what is the rehearsal process like for a TV show? In uh, something like a sitcom, it's very, very easy because uh, you do it all in one night. God, it's so different from a movie, you know, you shoot maybe three pages a day. In a sitcom, you shoot 60 pages. And what happens is Monday you go in, you sit at a table and you read it out loud, and that's the first time that the writers have actually heard anything. Then you go home. The next day you come in at like 11 o'clock and they've made all their changes and sent their new, new scripts out. And you read it again and get on your feet. Then you go home. Then the third day you basically, you rehearse a little bit. And the fourth day, you camera block. And the fifth day, you shoot it. And that's the only day you go in, uh, uh, you know, you, you put a lot of hours in. It, it happens so fast, you know, it, it just really does. It's, uh, you're getting changes clear up until the last minute. It's very hard, especially when you get to my age, <laughs> you know, really, to um, when you're sitting in, and they're, they're putting your makeup on for you and, and, and the a stage manager's handing you new pages that you, some people thrive on that. Kelsey thrives on that. The rest of us just go around like crazy trying to memorize them. But uh, he loves to keep it right at the very front of his head and get rid of it as soon as it's over and just memorize it long enough to say the lines and then move on to something else. He never memorized anything. And it would drive people crazy when we were in the hair and makeup uh, trailer and we're getting ready to go on and guest stars would be there. And they can see he doesn't know anything. He doesn't know any of these lines. Oh, oh my God, what's going to happen? What are, what are we going to do? And then just before we shot each scene, he'd, get, he'd be with the script supervisor, and they'd go over it, and he'd do it, and then he'd forget it again. It was amazing. It really was. I've never seen anything like that. Talk about the dynamic on that show, uh -huh. the father-son dynamic. Uh -huh. Because I don't want to get emotional, but anyway, right. uh, uh -huh. I identify with that because my father is you. And I'm, right. You know, and yeah. Boy. I was definitely a father figure to both those boys. Um, Kelsey, you know, has, comes from quite a tragic background with his family. Yes. A lot of deaths, a lot of uh, horrible things that have happened to him and his family. And he really relied on me to be there for him and to be a, a steadying, steady, um, encouraging uh, presence in his life, which I tried very hard to do. David too, although David had his, David still had both his parents when the when the show started. Uh, as unfortunately, he doesn't not anymore. But I I would say that I spent a good deal of my time with all everybody in that cast, trying to be a bit of a father. I mean, I didn't want to preach to them. I didn't want to tell them what to do. I didn't want to you know I didn't want to be Robert Young or anything. I just but I wanted to be there for them because they. They looked up to me because of my age, because of, I'd been around a lot longer than they had. I, I worked a lot more you know, than, than they had. And so they just needed encouragement and love, and that's what I gave them. And, and when did you know it was time to end the show? 
I would have said after 10 years, we went one extra year. Kelsey wanted to keep going, but I thought that I detected a couple of parts of the show. Every show, you know, of course, has an A story and a B story. And so it got to a point where, you know, we've done this before. How could you not? 11 years, 24 episodes a year. Uh, so that's 48 stories that you're telling uh, every year. Do that for 11 years, and you've got to start repeating yourself. And, and I didn't want to limp out. I wanted to, you know, go out in a blaze of glory. And, and that's pretty much, I think, what we did. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, we went 11 years, uh, and it and was And he great. came to Chicago. Yes, yeah. End. Oh, yeah, that's right. right. It was yeah. great. They came to Chicago quite a bit, you know. But I, uh, I had them, um, I used to, uh, well, I still do, actually. Uh, I'm involved in this, uh, an organization that puts on this thing called Ubilati, which is, uh, takes care of the uh, uh, AIDS people who have nowhere to go. And, have no, uh, and every year, they, all the opera singers who happen to be in town at that particular time get together and they put on this show. It's called the Ubilati. And there's you know, great people like Bryn Terfel and Renee Fleming and, and Domingo and all of these people. And so I asked uh, David one time, I said, I'm hosting this uh, Ubilati. Would you come and do something? He said, absolutely. So we were talking about what he was going to do. And it was going to be a Flanders and Swan funny song. And so we were rehearsing it. And Kelsey said, what are you guys doing? He said, oh, David's coming into town to do this show for me, uh, this Ubilati show. Well, can I come? I said, yeah, <laughs> sure you can. So Kelsey and David came in, and we did this huge, great show, all these wonderful opera singers from the Lyric doing their thing, and then Kelsey and David and everybody singing the Hippopotamus song. Oh, you know, wow. and it, was, it was great. It really was. Now, you and Randy Reed oh. need your own sitcom. <laughs> yes, yes, we really do. No, your chemistry is amazing. I adore Rondi. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, we've been husband and wife at least ten right? times. I know. I know. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's go-to casting. Yes, go yeah. Go-to casting. I love Rhonda. She's so great. Yeah. So what's next? What are you doing? Well, for me, um, I've got, I'm, I did an episode of, have you ever heard of this TV series in London called, well, actually, it's not London, it's Manchester, called uh, Foil's War? No. With Michael Kitchen. It's been on the air for about 20 years. They've done about eight different series of it. And it takes place during the war and immediately after. And Michael Kitchen is the star of it. And it's a brilliant show, and I've always loved it. And out of the blue, they asked me to do it. So I wow. flew over, uh, about six months ago, I flew over to England. We shot it in Liverpool, but they let me stay in Manchester, which I still have family there. And so that was great. And I uh, did that. So that's coming up. I got a play at Steppenwolf going into rehearsal in March, and, uh, and, and then this gig tomorrow night at the auditorium. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's great. And are we ever going to see you, Kelsey, and David in a play? Oh, I'd love to. Love to. I'd love to. We were offered a play one time, Art. We yeah, were oh, asked oh to God. replace the Broadway cast <gasps> during our hiatus. And it didn't happen, and it didn't happen mostly because my agent thought it was great, but I, I, David's agent said, no, I think maybe you should initiate something. You should start, you should start something, not go in as a replacement. And it wasn't that, really. It would have been just great for oh the three God. of us to do that for two or three months, you know. And I'd still, yeah, I would love to do something with Kelsey and David. Weren't they offer the producers as well at one point? Um, they might have been. Yeah. I wasn't. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, oh but I'd God. love to do a play with them. I really would. And one of the best uh, Tony speeches was a couple years ago when... Um, um, Kelsey was oh, giving David. Oh, right, oh, right. God, yes. Yeah, I know. I saw great. him in the Oh, my God. Oh, Kelsey? Uh -huh. Yeah, he's great. He's, nobody realizes what a wonderful voice he has. You oh, my know? God, gorgeous. I saw him do uh, Sweeney Todd uh, in front of uh, Stephen Sondheim in L.A. Just um, uh, three nights only with Christine Baranski. It was an amazing, amazing wow. time. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, and boy, David. Oh, David, I mean, it's just... He's just so natural. He's unbelievable. He's getting ready to direct a play on Broadway, I think, a musical that his partner Brian wrote. And uh, the, it should be really, really interesting. Um, he's, 
He's pretty much given up films, I think. He pretty much is a Broadway baby now, and he just wants to do plays and musicals and, and direct on Broadway, well, which is great. Well, 11 years of cashing the oh, check. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, I'm helps. the same way. Right. I'm perfectly happy doing my, the rest of my life spending it in, in little storefront theaters in Chicago. That's right. fine with me. I have no desire to go back on, uh, you know, in front of a camera. Well, we'll stay here. We want you to stay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. It's my I pleasure. I'm such a fan. Oh, thank you. Thank you. We did. Hmm. Yeah. Uh oh, they, they oh. want us to talk about the 125, which, oh. we, which we did at the beginning. Oh, <laughs> an amazing, amazing yeah. thing. It really is. The, you know, it's not only that it's the 125th anniversary. When you see the names of the people that are here, I mean, it's everybody from John Philip Sousa to Anna Pavlova to Sarah Bernhardt to, you know, and, and the design, Adler and Sullivan, which they're not even going to mention tomorrow. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright was like, like uh, right. uh, the guy who ran around <laughs> just <laughs> drawing things for them. Uh, but it's incredible. And then, of course, I remember the first time I came here. I was going to graduate school came to visit some friends in Chicago and they said they had tickets for uh, the Auditorium Theater for the Joffrey Ballet. And it was Jeffrey Holder and it was just something I'd never forget as long as I live, how brilliant that was. So I bet Midler here, I've seen, God, I've seen so many things here. Yeah, and it's one of those theaters that can house anything. Yes. It could be intimate, yet it could be grand. Right. And it, very yeah. few places can do that. That's true. And I swear to God, you could whisper and be, be heard Everywhere, it's oh, the best acoustics I've ever heard. Literally, yeah. You were yeah. talking about that earlier. Where you oh yeah. Yell or whisper on one section, and it goes up and around. Yeah, 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 yeah. They knew what they were doing. So Patty Lapone can actually whisper. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Patty. Patty doesn't know the meaning of the word <laughs> no. whisper, but no, but yeah. she could if she wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And we will be back. Um, after these commercial messages. Okay. That was our interview with John Mahoney. I hope you liked it. Um, we actually did another interview with the head of the um, Auditorium Theater who told us a little bit of history about the last 125 years. But what we're going to do is, because this is starting the new season, it's already 2015, we're going to actually just show you some excerpts of shows that are coming up. The first shows that I want to talk about are only going to be here for a week, and um, they're worth seeing right away. First is Fifty Shades of Grey. Of course, the movie's coming out pretty soon, so you might want to see the play because the book came first. So um, that's playing at the Broadway Playhouse in Chicago. That's through um, Chicago Broadway Theater, and that's playing until January 18th. So let's see a scene of Fifty Shades of Grey. Fifty Shades of Grey that's playing at the Broadway Playhouse. Next is the Lyric Opera. This is a wonderful opera. It only comes every once in a while and it's Anna Bolina. And this is the story of Anne Boleyn who was married to Henry VIII. And because uh, Henry VIII wasn't happy with her, he basically was already having an affair with um, another woman but because of religious beliefs, he had to find a way to discredit her and, of course, terminate her. This is a wonderful opera, great sets, wonderful music, and it's only playing again till January 18th, so do get tickets to Anna Bolina. And, the, and let's see an excerpt of um, Anna Bolina at the Lyric Opera.
was Anna Bolina at the Lyric Opera. From there, we're going to go back to Broadway in Chicago, where we have a brand new premiere of a new musical called Beautiful. It's a Carole King musical. It's basically the story of that famous singer, writer, composer, Carole King, who was famous in the 60s and 70s. It's a great show. I do highly recommend it. Um, that's playing until February 21st before it goes to New York. So, as I always tell people, see it now, because when it goes to New York and wins a Tony and comes back, the ticket prices are going to be a lot higher. So let's see a scene from Beautiful, the Carole King musical. So that was beautiful, and that's playing until February 21st. So if you get a chance, see that. Okay, our next show, we should be back in the studios. Uh, we will bring in uh, our resident critics, and we will discuss what's coming up for the new season. From Chicago Theater Review, I'm Frank, and we will see you at the theater.